Hello and welcome to my page. Today is Monday and we are filming True Crime and Makeup Monday. As always, we have a content warning for graphic content, descriptions of crime scenes, sometimes crimes against children, and just some generally sketchy, shady shit, you know. Today we're going to be talking about John Fountainberry. First of all, I, I don't know, Fountainberry. Just, it sounds like a clown name, not an actual name, but yeah. Anyway, John Joseph Fountainberry was an, Amer an American serial killer, a long-haul trucker. Fountainberry befriended and subsequently murdered five people across four states between 1990 and 1991. And after his arrest, confessed to an additional... 1984 murder for which another man was convicted. He was sentenced to death for one of his killings and subsequently executed at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility in 2009. Born on July 4th, 1963 in New London, Connecticut, Fountainberry's father um, was a former Marine and former police officer. Fountainberry's parents divorced shortly after John Jr.'s sister was born, um, rejected by his father and grandparents. Young John was placed um, in the care of his mother, who went on to marry twice more. He was ignored by his stepfather, suffering beatings for the smallest of mistakes, once for confusing a potato salad with tomato salad. According to Fountainberry, uh, he would use an imaginary hammer to nail his and his sister's blankets to the beds in an effort to not get taken away by malicious forces. The uh, family often changed residences, shifting between Ohio and Hawaii before moving to North Kingston, Rhode Island in 1983. By that time, Fountainberry had already had run into the law. He had stolen a 1968 Chrysler in Atlanta, but was later captured in health Heflin, Alabama, Heflin, if I can speak, Alabama, after, um, after leaving a gas station without paying for gas. Yeah, they'll always manage to get you for that. Like, I don't know. I mean, I guess if you need gas, you're going to have to, like, get it. But you should probably pay for it. But he hasn't committed, like, any big, big crime. So I can't say at this point that they should have just kept him in jail because he hasn't really committed any big, big crimes yet. Yet. Being the operative word. Um, in 19... In 1985, his mother died of cancer leaving Fountainberry to become even more disillusioned and untrusting of people with him developing a growing addiction to drugs and alcohol. Unfortunately, that seems to be how this always starts. They always have some kind of addiction to something, uh, whether it be sex, whether it be drugs, whether it be alcohol. Rock and roll. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But they always seem to have an addiction to something. And it, it does affect the brain. It does affect the way that people look at things and how they act. And I'm not saying that it doesn't, but I'm also not saying that that is 100% the reason why people commit crimes. Because it's not. Because there's plenty of people with addictions that don't go off and murder five people in the span of a year. There are plenty of people who just do things who do things that they regret but they don't cost you know the lives of others so not by any means am i saying that addiction is like 100 percent the reason to blame but it always seems like no matter what serial killer i cover there's an addiction to something and that's what they want to blame their issue on which obviously is not legit i mean it might be but i don't know like i said there's plenty of people i know that have addictions that didn't go off and murder five people in a year so I don't know how much I would be like, oh yeah, his his drug addiction is is totally why he killed these people. No. And um, in order to support himself, he held several short-term jobs as a long-haul trucker. 
um, traveling all across the United States, but was often fired for poor performance and negligence. I wonder what, like, what that means in, like, the trucking world. So if you, like, are a trucker or you know a trucker and you follow me, can you, like, comment and, like, tell me what that means? Like, what, what do you have to be negligent of in order to be fired for negligence? Does that make sense? Like, because I don't... Unless, because I mean, I guess it could be negligence if you're like bad driving, if you're like being reckless, maybe. I don't know, but yeah. By the time his murders began, he acquired several more convictions for minor offenses, minor offenses, including carrying a concealed weapon in Ohio, and a public disturbance charge in Ladyard, Connecticut. Now, I'm in Ohio. We are big on, you know, the right to bear arms, but we're big on it being done legally. So, like, <laughs> if you don't have a license to carry, they will get you for it because they want it to be, you know, obviously by the book. Now, I'm sure there's people out there who own guns that, like, don't register them. I'm sure they exist serial killers, murderers, you know, whatever. But Ohio is very, very big on, like, if they see you with a gun, you better have your license with you because they will be all over it. Um, with the help of his birth father, he moved to Portland, Oregon in 1986. Shortly after arriving in Portland, John Jr.'s father moved out of the house, taking John Jr.'s two half-brothers to Southern Oregon. At that time, John Jr. started having an affair with his stepmother, Olivia Herndon. Not illegal, but weird. It's okay. I know we're all thinking it. But no, it's actually not illegal. Should be. But it's not. <laughs> um, John Sr. and Olivia finally divorced. John Jr. and Olivia continued their relationship for many years. While they never married, they were together for nearly 15 years, even while he was incarcerated. Fountainberry's first confirmed victim was 47-year-old Donald, Donald Don Nutley from Waco, Texas. The pair crossed paths in November 1990 at a truck stop in Troutdale, Oregon. You know who else killed people? Wasn't that an Eileen Runros who also killed like men in truck stops? Am I am I wrong? But I, I think that's who it was. And then you know we had like the I-95 killer. <laughs> Trucking is apparently a murderous profession. <laughs> And upon learning that Nutley was going to Mount Hood for target practice, Fountainberry offered to accompany him. Don agreed, and the two men traveled to the area where Nutley promptly vanished. His disappearance remained a mystery until April 21st, 1991, when his skull, teeth and skull, complete with a bullet hole, were found in a wooded area northeast of rural Zigzag. I've never heard of Zigzag. I have never heard of Zigzag, but I, I, that sounds like a really cool town name, I guess. I live in Zigzag. <laughs> On February 1st, 1991, Fountainberry encountered 27-year-old fellow trucker uh, Gary Farmer from Springfield, Tennessee at the pilot truck stop in Bloomsbury, New Jersey, not far from I-78. According to Fountainberry, Farmer supposedly made unwanted sexual advances on him, because of which, because of which he killed him in retaliation, robbing Farmer of a knife, watch, and forty dollars before leaving his body in the truck's sleeping compartment. Farmer's body was found on February fifth, and remained unidentified for a few days after his identity was recovered. Authorities released a sketch of a man wanted for questioning in his death. Um, according to his employer, CPA America, Farmer was on a cross-country 
route bound for Hunter Dinn County at the time of his death. At the time of the murder, Fountainberry was traveling towards Zion, Illinois, and had stopped at the truck stop to have breakfast. 16 days later, 45-year-old Joseph Darren Jr., a divorced father and dad, a supervisor at the Community Mutual Blue Cross and Shield, went missing from Miami Township in Ohio. Oh, that's not far from here. After driving, after, bleh, after dropping off his two daughters at their mother's home in Union Township. Two days after, a co-worker filed a missing persons report. I mean, I guess at least we know the kids were safe. And unfortunately, you know, they have to live with the fact that obviously their father has been murdered. But at least the kids are safe. And I don't know. I just feel like that gives me some peace of mind when I do things like this. Because, like, it's so sad when I do these cases where it's like he kidnapped the father. And the father had two girls with him. So, of course, he couldn't leave the two daughters behind. He had to take them, too. And then you know unspeakable things are done and and usually they're also murdered and so i i like it when i get a story in which it's not kids kids take a lot out of me doing this for a living <laughs> um after some time passed darren still hadn't been located but strangely enough his white 1988 subaru had been spotted in portland oregon and idaho in addition to his credit cards be, had been used, in addition to that, his credit cards had been used a total of 25 times by, um, by none other than Fountainberry himself. So, like, he was not good at this. I mean, that's evident. Um, obviously... If you're going to use a dead person's credit cards, maybe not so many times because that's going to be like super suspicious. Okay, I'm just saying, like, he didn't think this through. On March 20th, a motorist pulled off the road near River Downs in Anderson Township, finding the body of a man. Judging by the man's clothing and physical description, it was quickly concluded that the deceased was Joseph Darren. Posing, pose, posing as a hitchhiker, Fountainberry was picked up by the good-natured Darren, proceeded to kill and rob him afterwards. Using Darren's car, Fountainberry crisscrossed through several states before finding himself at a party in Portland on February 23rd where he met 32-year-old local bank teller, uh, Christine Ann Guthrie. She agreed to accompany John to the Coastal, Coastal Silver Sands Motel in Rockaway Beach, Florida. Sorry, not Florida, in Rockaway Beach. It doesn't say Florida. <laughs> where the pair were seen by hotel owner Anna Modrell. Following their meetup, um, Guthrie vanished with her body found on April 1st near the remote logging community of Timber. I'm sorry, and and, and I, I have to say this because it's going to bug me if I don't, but like when I, when I found out that this town of Timber's main export was lumber, it made me laugh because, you know, like everybody always, when they talk about chopping down trees, they'll always be like, Timber. And I just thought that was a great name for a town that's main export is wood. I'm easily entertained, I guess. But, yeah. Um. She had died from a gunshot wound to the head. From there, Fountainberry drove to the Seattle Tacoma International Airport, abandoning Darren's car at the parking lot. He bought a one-way ticket to Juneau, Alaska, arriving there on March second or third. I mean, as a, as a like person, I, you it's so out there to me that there are serial killers in Alaska because like you kind of forget that that's an inhabitable place and people live there because it's so you know 
up north and so cold like you forget so like when I was doing this serial killer by state and I was like Alaska and there was more than one person listed I was like of all the places where I would expect to have serial killers pop up I probably would expect California to be the busiest or biggest California New York but Alaska Alaska had almost I think like 10 listed I mean, you do what you gotta do, I guess. Um, arriving there on March 2nd or 3rd, finding work on a fishing boat, and moving into the downtown Bergman Hotel. So, living in a hotel, that can't be cheap, I bet. But that gets expensive. I'm sure I bet that gets expensive. I bet that gets expensive. I bet that gets expensive. I would, sorry, I'm rambling. <laughs> On March 14th, he was hanging out at a rural bar, having been fired from his job at the fishing boat, when he came across 39-year-old Jefferson Jeff Diffie, a miner who worked, a, a coal miner, not a miner as in a child, a miner who works at the Greens Creek Silver Mine. The two struck up a conversation and Diffie, feeling sorry for the newcomer who wasn't accustomed to the Alaskan wilderness, invited Fountainberry to his condominium. There, Fountainberry proceeded to beat and stab him 17 to 18 times before stealing Diffie's wallet, automatic teller machine card, and so ATM card, and nine millimeter handgun. The following day, he withdrew $400 from Diffie's account, a move noted by authorities. In the meantime, co-workers had filed a missing persons report for Diffie, who hadn't gone to work in two days. And apparently this was, like, very unusual for him to just not show up or, and not call. So, like, they were on it. Three days after killing Diffie, Fountainberry, who had been under surveillance since his linkage to Joseph Darren's stolen car, was arrested at his hotel room in Juneau. Jeff's bank card was found in his hotel room as well. During the course of his interrogations, Fountainberry confessed a total of six murders, including the 1984 stabbing death of a 25-year-old of homeless man, Richard F. Combs, in Roseburg, Oregon. According to Fountainberry, the two met in a park and began drinking as John drank more. He got angrier at the fact that he had recently been fired from his job. And in a fit of rage, he supposedly stabbed Combs in the throat and dumped his body on the freeway. However, another man was already serving a sentence for that crime. 28-year-old Michael T. Collier had confessed and pleaded guilty to manslaughter in the Combs case, but had since recanted. The lead concerning Fountainberry was investigated, but in the end, it was abandoned. He also briefly cons was considered. He was also briefly considered a suspect in a Doctor No murders due to his job as a long haul trucker, and even questioned about the slaying of a fellow truck driver in New York, but was eventually cleared of suspicion. Ow, oh, hold on. I hate when my ear goes much like that. After a tape-recorded telephone interview with WKRC-TV, in which he confessed to four of his murders, Fountainberry attempted suicide by cutting his wrist with a razor, but was found... Sorry, give me just a second. I forgot to get a brush out. but was found in time and saved. During his imprisonment, Fountainberry was profiled as a serial killer according to the FBI's definition, with newspapers drawing comparisons to other murderers, such as Ted Bundy, Richard Bigenwald, and the recently captured Eric Napoliano. Fountainberry denied himself being one, As he believed 
he didn't fit the criteria as he murdered for money, not for sexual or sexual satisfaction. Fountainberry was held at the at the Lemon Creek Correctional Center initially on a one million dollar bail, which was increased to three million dollars following additional charges. He was indicted for the murders of Diffie, Farmer, and Darren, and was first to stand trial in Alaska. In exchange for the other charges being dropped, he pleaded guilty to killing Diffie and was given a 99-year prison term in Alaska. He was then extradited to Ohio, where he was sentenced to death for the murder of Joseph for the murder of Joseph Darren and sent off and sent off. I can't speak today, man. To await execution at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility. In September of that year, he was extradited to New Jersey, where he pleaded guilty to murder in the Farmer case and was given a life sentence. Following his death sentence, as per Ohio law, Fountainberry automatically filed for appeal on several occasions, but every time he was unsuccessful. By 2008, when Fountainberry had exhausted all of his state and federal appeals, Prosecutor Joe Dieters formally requested his execution. His bids for parole were also denied as a result of protests from family members of his victims. On July 14, 2009, he was executed by lethal injection at the Southern State Ohio Correctional Facility, about two hours after the Supreme Court denied a final request to delay the procedure. That is the story of um, John Fountainberry. Sad story. And it, it's sad that, you know, th these people lost their lives. Um, as always, Please don't do anything I wouldn't do. Be cautiously kind to others and make good choices. I'll see y'all next week. Bye.